Yesterday I taught you in just a very short period of time how to just about win every single time against those that are coming after you and what you need to do. But I'm going to go in more depth and detail today. Yesterday it was just about covering a lot of things just so that you know what it's really like out there and what you really need to do. A lot of people come to this with the idea, oh gosh, I can, I can do one thing that's going to change my status. And that's it. And it's not true. You have to do... You have to do quite a few things to right the wrongs you've already made all your life without knowing what you've been doing. And you have to do those steps. You right those wrongs. And then in the future, from that point on, your only job is to tell them no. Tell them no, tell them no, tell them no. Correct the errors that they make and educate them so they don't do it again. The rest of the time you can be fishing. That's what I say. Unfortunately, it's kind of a full-time job for a lot of people. But all the documents that are mentioned on, on this, I can get to you. And that's the purpose of writing your email and stuff down. Um, you send me a little note that says, hey, I need this. I'm at this stage. And I'll help you through that stage. Okay? That's what I'm here for. I don't want you to feel like... You leave here, and this is what you got, and you're left on your own. You're not. Now, one thing I do want to mention is when you take a document from anyone and you use it, it is your document. It no longer is mine or whoever else you got it from. It's yours. So you have to make it yours. You have to remove stuff out of there that doesn't apply and put in what applies to you. <laughs> okay? So make it yours. A lot of times, I've told this to people. I've sent them documents. They send it back to me and say, hey, can you look this over for me make sure it's all right? And I go, well, wait a minute. What about this and this and this? Did you read this document? Did you check it to make sure everything applies to you because I'll bet it doesn't you know <laughs> and uh, go from there so just know that up front any legal form you have to make it yours and again I'm going to remind you attorneys write forms everybody says oh do you have a template for that Oh, God, I hate that word, template. <laughs> I hate it worth a passion. And I get that 10 times a day. Do you have a template for that? Attorneys write forms to remove the liability from them and place it upon you. They're filled with lines and boxes and things that don't belong there. They're filled with language that removes their liability from them and places it upon you. A lot of people think, oh, I can just go down to the county courthouse and they've got this form that I can fill out and, and, and get my case started. And No, they're screwing you when you do that and you don't even know it. <clears throat> so be very careful with any form, any contract you sign. Attorneys run this world, and that's who we the people are at war with. And it's sad to say. So we're gonna, we are going to talk about the eight elements of a contract today. But when you go through this steps, I'm going to go through it really quick, because we didn't yesterday, we just kind of handed it out. The number one most important thing is to change your status. Status, standing, and jurisdiction is everything in the law. I cannot say that enough. It's incredibly important. If you don't know who you are, don't expect to win. Expect to lose. That's kind of a harsh statement well, now that I think about it. But <clears throat> we walk in by general appearance. We just show up. We're asked to plead guilty or not guilty. Both are commercial terms. You never plead guilty and you never plead not guilty. 
you declare your innocence. Okay? Guilty and not guilty are commercial terms. You declare your innocence. All right, so the very first thing, again, is the affidavit of repudiation, most important thing you can do. Once you send that off, it is not finished and it is not complete. You must get the certified proof of service. I recommend you send it registered mail, not certified, registered, with return receipt requested. Get the return receipt do the sheet that's a certified proof of service sheet, which I can give you. Once you do that, from the date that they received it, you have to give them 21 days to respond. They never respond, but on the 22nd day, you do the certified judgment of unrebutted affidavit. It's a certified judgment of unrebutted affidavit. Because they did not respond, they acquiesced, and you're, ju you're calling the judgment. You're judgmenting it. You put all three of those documents together, and then you go record them with the county. That's called publicly publishing them. So we publicly publish our documents. Your documents become a court of record when they're properly served, publicly published, and then filed. Okay? If you have no reason to file the document right away because you're not in trouble, you file it at home in your file cabinet, and you wait. <laughs> and you're going to use that document later, I'm sure. I'm positive but at least it's on their public record. It's publicly published. Anyone can find it if they want to search, okay? Then if you're able, some people aren't because of child support and other aspects, but if you're able, you go get your passport. On this document, I tell you exactly how to do a passport. I mean, I spelled it out for you because a lot of people get it wrong. Post offices are transfer stations. They are not who issues your passport. All they do is collect the information and they send it to the passport agency. 99.997% of the time, they're doing it for US citizens. That means they are doing it a certain way over and over and over and over again, the same way all the time. So if you're expecting to change your status to a state national, they don't know how to do that at the post office, okay? And they can't communicate it to the guy that's issuing the passport. And because of that, a lot of state nationals do not get a state national passport when they go through the post office. And they've had to learn this the hard way, okay? So you have to go to the passport agency that issues the passport, a State Department office. Unfortunately, living in Utah, your closest one is Denver. You could go to Seattle if you want to hit the coast, or you can go to San Francisco if you want to go see the, the freaks down there. Define state national, one who owes their allegiance to the state. In other words, that's what you were all born, by the way. Uh, you were born as... Californians and Oregonians and Utahns and Wisconsinites and Floridians and Texans. That's a state national. Okay? Everyone was born that way. And then you grew up and you started checking boxes that you were a U.S. citizen and you volunteered to be a citizen, a person, and a resident. The definition of citizen for the city means municipal, zen is servant. Municipal servant, same thing as a public servant, an employee of government, that's exactly what it means. A person is a vessel or an entity, corporation, an office of 
It's defined as all those things. An office of. So you can think of it as you get a job on board a ship, you're an office officer of that ship. You're also the signatory officer of that ship. So you sign the bills of lading, you pay the bills, you pay the port taxes. That's what you do as a person. A person is not a man. In fact, the Bible says, be the man and not the person. Don't put flattering titles of person upon the man. For if you do, it's a sin and he will surely take you away. So he tells us not to be the person. In this day and age, there are times when you pretty much have to be. I'd like it if we didn't have to be. But sometimes we have to be right now just to defend ourselves and to hold our public servants accountable. That's the main time where we have to step into court. Pro se is when we're going after them. So we're going in representing our person when we're going after them. When we're defending ourselves, we're sui juris. We're of a one's own rights. We're a man or a woman. Okay. All right. Number three is a deed of reconveyance. This reconveys your ownership of your all caps name, which is your vessel, to your Christian name. So in other words, it's tying the two together. It's taking ownership. The man or woman is taking ownership of the vessel. This must be recorded to make it a court of record. If it's not recorded, you haven't taken ownership. It's that simple. You gotta record your title. Now, if possible, I am a firm believer in a patent of nativity. The reason being is a patent of nativity shows that you existed on this land before there even was a government. Not everybody can do that. For those that do genealogy, it's pretty easy. You know, if, if you can trace the history, and I could show you mine on my iPad, but mine has my family crest on it from Germany from the 14 or 1500s. And then it has my father's lineage and my mother's lineage. Back, I only went back on that patent and nativity prior to 1776. That's as far back as I care if you go. But if you can trace your family on these shores back before 1776, then you're grandfathered. Okay? You ex your DNA was on these shores before government even existed. These documents, what they do is they show intent. Intent, I was going to go over that today anyway, mm -hmm. might as well do it right now. Intent is very important in the law. You c if you don't have intent to commit a crime, you really didn't commit a crime. They've got, a, a court has to prove you had intent to commit it. Okay. Um, so any of these documents, uh, Anna von Rice's 928 docs, those kind of things, those, those don't do anything for you as far as changing your status. But they prove your intent that you wanted to change your status. Does that make sense? Without an affidavit to the Secretary of State, as far as the United States law is concerned, you haven't changed your status. They define your status in Title VIII, Section 1101 of the U.S. Code, and says here it is, here's the definitions, here's all the different things you can be. And then we have the unalienable right of self-determination, which is free, our free agency, to pick which one we wanna be and then notify them in writing under the penalty of perjury, which is an affidavit, and let them know who we wanna be. Somebody at the Department of State takes those affidavits and they put it into the computer system. It usually takes them 30 to 60, sometimes 90 days. Who knows how long with COVID, but they put it into the system eventually and they can pull it up. Can police. COVID, use the yeah, that's a terrible name. I, 
Yeah. See the sheep surrender. Okay. So. You know, it probably could. It's good to see if you can do it on the paternal and the maternal side, both all the way down. Okay, now, if you can't do a patent and nativity, you'll notice on the sheet that I put it if possible, and then a declaration, optional. If you can't do the patent and nativity, do a declaration. Declare who you are and that you belong here. <laughs> okay, and record it. If you can do two to three documents, and I prefer three, try and always achieve three things. One of them changes your status and the other two prove your intent. So if you've got multiple things that prove your intent, it's like having multiple witnesses. This was my intent to do this. Nobody forced me into it, nobody coerced me into it. Number six, if you are a property owner, and, I, and that doesn't just mean a house, could mean your car, household goods, anything. If you're a property owner, you need to have your superior title. So if you have your house, you need to put it back in the, in the original land patent. <laughs> now what does that mean, put it back in the original land patent? It's kind of vague. No, the land patent is underlying the land. Someone, someone many years ago, usually in the 1800s, patent a piece of land. Maybe it was, you know, 360 acres or 640 acres or 160 acres, right? That land was given to that person for labor that he put into it and a small fee that he had to pay. And usually that land patent was signed by a president of the United States to that person's himself his heirs, successors, and or assigns forever. So even the government can't take it back, okay? Now, by posting the land patent number on your property, and remember, now you may just own that little lot on the corner, <laughs> and it was 160 acres, right? So it's a part and parcel thereof, and the lot has a meets and bounds description. It says from this marker that might be way over there, it's so many feet to your property corner, and then it's so many feet from that property corner to that property corner to that property corner to that property corner, to that property corner and back to that one. That's a meets and bounds description, okay? So you have to put it in meets and bounds, and like I, read off on this tax statement yesterday. This man's property, he's got three lots, and it sits on two land patent numbers, 6743 and 6747. But what did they change his legal description to? Lot 76, a stable acre subdivision. Is that a meets and bounds? No, that's SMU. That shit made up. Okay? This is what they go by. They create an invoice with a whole bunch of errors, and we write them a check and send it in. Pay our property taxes. Now we just acquiesce to all their errors. So they stole the property. The county steals the property on behalf of the state from you, you get a warranty deed, an abstract of title. What is an abstract? Fake. That's right, it's something it, that represents something. It's, it's a fallacy, it's a color of law, okay? So <laughs> you, get a, you get a warranty deed and you go, oh man, I own my first home, great. And you don't even own it. The state can come in and take it away from you, foreclose on you, get you if, if you don't pay a couple years back taxes. I don't know what these houses around here go for, but let's just say that's 300,000 bucks for that corner house on that lot, on the park, right? I don't know what it's worth. 
I don't know property values around here, but let's just say it's worth three hundred thousand dollars. You get a property tax bill in the mail for thirteen hundred seven dollars and seventy three cents, and you don't pay it for three years. You owe three thousand four thousand, rough just under four thousand dollars total, and the county comes in and takes your three hundred thousand dollar house for four thousand bucks. Is that right? No, but they can do it because you didn't own it in the first place. You have, in the law, it states this, you have the right to make a profit and incur a loss. That's your privilege for buying that house. You might have put $50,000 cash down and owe two fifty, dollars right? But you have the right to make a profit and incur a loss. I don't think that's fair. <laughs> so let's do something about it. Yes, it would be considered a low deal status. The king's land. You own it. Nobody else can. What do you call it? A low deal. A low deal. Um, Ron Gibson wrote a book about land, called Land Patents. Ron's a good friend of mine. I've known him since 2009 or 10. Um, he and I put our properties in land patent about the same period of time, back about 2009 or 10. Anyway, uh, he went on to study the process and ended up writing a book about it and ended up being a professor at the University of Southern Oregon down in Medford teaching land patents, mainly to the miners. Miners, and those guys want to know all about land patents because they want the mineral rights, right? Anyway, in the first hundred pages of his book is nothing but law one paragraph after another of how that once you have it in a land patent, they can't take your property from you. There's 100 pages of case law just in the front of his book. On page 114, he teaches you how to put your property in a land patent. I'm sorry, who was the author? Ron Gibson. If you want the book, it's 45 bucks, and uh, I can get you either his email or a lot, of, a lot of people PayPal me, and I send it down and give the book to you. But Does that put our mortgages or our homes in danger that we have them now? Because if somebody went back and found the original grant deed and found the patent, they could take our property. Yes, correct. You know, they can. They can if they had right at some point in time. Let's just say it was an owner who owned your house 30 years ago. And now all of a sudden... He says, hmm, I'm 65 years old. I need a place to live the rest of my life. He had a security interest in it at one time. He could go take, accept the last grant deed and the patent, kick your ass out. So my understanding of the current system, if we own real estate and we want our children to benefit from it, they have to pay state taxes on that if we bequeath it to them. That's without the land patent option. That's real estate law. Well, sure, but they don't own it either. The state owns it. Yeah, you're not giving them anything except the opportunity to make a profit or incur a loss. In other words, they'd have to sell it at, in a high market to actually for you to give them anything. Right. Otherwise, you cost them something if they lose it or, you know, anyway. If they've got to put in a road or a highway, th that, that was basically written in the law way back when there was land patents. For, they, they wrote it in for railroad purposes, wagon roads, postal roads, all those reasons. And really, every road here is a postal road. People don't know that. So is it domain plus oh, eminent domain. The difference is they've got to pay you market value for it. If you have the land patent, they've got to pay you market value. Okay, so they can't condemn your property. They've got to pay you market value, but you have to sell. If you fight them on selling, then they can condemn it. But if you don't declare war, you just say, all right, here's two appraisals. This is what it's worth. Give me the money. You can put in your road. There's not much you can do about that. But... Well, get them as high as you want. <laughs>
Well, the, the point is the way our country was founded on Christian principles is that giving up the property is for the greater good of all. I know that's hard. That's harsh, actually, to have me have to say that to you. But it is. And that's the way the law, original laws were written way back when, that you give it up for railroads, for uh, postal roads, for things that are to the greater good of all of us, and you give it up. But if you've got a land patent, your status is right. You should, you should get fair market value. They, they can't come in and offer you 50 grand for a $300,000 house just to put a road in. Well, it has to be third party independent market value people. So you got to get two or three values. On your car your, or trailers or whatever is licensed on the road, typically, you need to have your MCO or MSO, your manufacturer's statement of origin. In Europe, they call it the manufacturer's certificate of origin. So it depends on if it's a Volvo or if it's a Ford or a Chevy, right? But it's either an MSO or an MCO. Most of the time, it's MSO. And you said we can't get that unless it's brand new. Well, here's the issue. Once the state gets it, they don't tend to give it up. So, how do you get around that? Salvage. Maritime salvage laws. Okay? How would you do that though? You get a mechanic to lie like hell and say it's totaled. <laughs> <laughs> so you hear, see that Lexus right there? That sucker's totaled. <laughs> yeah, see? And that's what you have to do to, to get a salvage title. Once you get a salvage title in hand, don't register it. There are some people that are woke up that'll pay more for one with a salvage title than a good one. True. Because they don't have to register it. You've already done their work for them. So all you got to do is find somebody that's awoke. If you don't, if you find somebody that wants to go register it, they're not going to pay as much. Right? To take dominion over the air, you must have a trust. If you don't have an express, which is a written trust, then they will imply a trust. So since we're here, this is a good point to tell the story for those that weren't here, and I'll tell it fairly quickly, so pay attention. All right. April 22nd, I think it was, I taught a, just a one-day class at the Department of Justice. And after I was done, a little attorney came up to me, and he said, can I tell you a story of what I learned from my father. And his history was his father was a judge and his grandfather was a judge. He came from a long line of judges and he was a graduate of Georgetown Law and he went to work for the Department of Justice. So that's his story. But he said when he was 16 years old, he got to sit in on one of his dad's classes and his dad was teaching new judges, judges who were just been voted in or appointed or whatever. And his dad said that when a man walks into a courtroom, the very first thing he sees is a little plaque up on the judge's desk that says, Your Honorable Bob Smith, or whatever his name is. The reason for that is honor is the first hat the judge has to put on. That's his first job title, Your Honor. You can't have trust without honor. You can't have honor without trust. So the three jurisdictions being land, air, and water, the land being common law, common to all mankind, is property, equity, and rights, the air being ecclesiastical or canon law, which is trust law, and the water being admiralty or commerce, which is contract law. Those are our three jurisdictions of law. He said, when a man walks into the courtroom, the Your Honor, playing the part of Your Honor, is looking for the man to have an express trust in hand. But if the man doesn't walk in with an express trust, which they seldom do, then the judge implies a trust where the judge is the executor, 
the man's a trustee who somehow mismanaged the trust on behalf of the beneficiary who's the prosecution. So therefore, because of his mismanagement, he owes the prosecution something, the beneficiary something. But if the man walks in with an express trust in hand that clearly states who the executor is, and it's not the judge, and it clearly states who the trustee is and has an acceptance of the trustee to be the trustee so it can't break the veil of the trust, tells exactly who the beneficiary is and it's not the prosecution, and it describes the property to be managed and how it's supposed to be managed, then there's nothing left for the judge to adjudicate in that jurisdiction of the heir because he's got his express trust in hand. So the judge swaps hats and he goes to a judge hat. Now he's looking for one or two things. Is there a victim? Then there's a crime. It's criminal, it goes to trial. If there's not, it's civil. And we know in this country that just about all crimes are civil. It goes civil, which means he's looking for the man to walk in with his superior titles in hand. Now think about that. That's not just, if it's a car case, it's your MSO. If it's uh, your house case, it's a patent or a grant deed, right? But what if it's about your kids? You got your birth certificate and your claim of right and your, your, your claim the vessel is your property. It's your superior titles. It's your superior title. Did you bring your birth certificate in? I mean, you might need it to pay the debt. See? So it's your superior titles in hand. If you did walk in with them, then he can't apply an abstract of title. So therefore, there's nothing for him to adjudicate. And he takes that hat off and he puts on a Mr. Administrator hat. Now he's in the jurisdiction of the water. He's looking to see if you have your business affairs in order. Do you have your copyrights and your trademarks? Do you have your contracts? Are your contracts in order? If you've taken dominion over that and every, your business affairs are in order, there's nothing for him to adjudicate. So he takes that hat off and he throws his hammer down and he leaves the room, case closed. But if we walk in taking dominion, leaving them nothing to adjudicate, we win every time. So that's the key to winning a court case. It's taking dominion over all three jurisdictions. Land is common law, common all mankind. It's property, equity, and rights. It's things given to us by God. Everything we have was either grown or it was mined. Everything came from God. We didn't make anything. We might have formed it into something, but everything was given to by him. So he is always the executor in my trust. Okay, the trust has to contain certain elements. Has to have an executor. It has to have a trustee. The trustee is called a fiduciary. A fiduciary is the highest form of law. When you have a fiduciary responsibility over another, a judge can't get in between those. Okay? A fiduciary. Fiduciary? Fiduciary. You're not the trustee of Hey, I speak to farm animals. <laughs> <laughs> I don't pronounce things right all the time. Is, it, is a fiduciary the trustee or the executive? The trustee is a fiduciary. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You must have a written acceptance by the trustee to be the trustee. Now, this is what most people leave out of their trusts. And this is why good attorneys break a trust veil. They break the veil and hold you personally responsible. Can you say that again? A written acceptance by the trustee? To be the trustee. You, you, you can't just take it upon yourself. You have to accept it. It's not really a letter. It's actually more like an affidavit. Yeah. And it's, it's an acceptance of a trustee. I, ha I have a copy of it. We can email it to you. Which is? If someone else appoints you as trustee, you still have to accept the trustee. I mean, I, I have the straight familia God trust, straight family God trust, okay? 
God is the executor. It's ran by righteous principles. I have a property list that's attached to that that covers any property you could possibly ever own now or in the future, okay? And then I have an acceptance that I'm the trustee and then my heirs, successors, and or signs forever would be my kids, my grandkids on down forever. They're the beneficiaries. They're the beneficiaries. So now as you buy more property, you have to now do some kind of asset. No, no my true. property list covers it all. Anything I ever would do in the future. The trust must show the property assets and income of the trust must be clearly stated. Describe how the trust should be managed. The trusts are signed in the center of the document. Trust should be recorded and anchored to the land if possible. So make them a court of record, anchor them to the land. Trusts are private. Even though you're making it public, what you're doing is notifying them that there is a trust. Now you do not have to file the trust itself. You can actually write up a separate document which is the notice of existence of trust and record it. You can do that, or you can just record your trust. If there's nothing in your trust to hide, go ahead and just record it. If there's something you don't want known, maybe you don't want your kids' names known, then don't record it. It's up to you. You can, you can record a notice the, of an existence of a trust. In 1791, was written the Second Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. That is my gun permit. That is my concealed weapons permit. Okay? I don't need a concealed weapons permit. I don't need a gun permit. I need, don't need to tell them what they, I can own and what I can't own. I don't care if it's a bump stock or a, a magazine that holds 50 rounds or 100. Okay? instead of 10. Like in California, you can only have 10 rounds. <laughs> they just, they just I don't even own anything that holds 10 rounds. They just okay? <laughs> if the military can have it, I can have it. Absolutely. If it's an M1 tank or an A10, I'll take it. Yeah. Okay? That's true. And they can't tell me any different because I can have anything as a militia that our military can have. But you have to be a militia. We all are yeah. militia. Like it or not, <laughs> every man of able be, body age. You, don't have to be declared militia. <laughs> you were declared a militia in the Constitution. Yep. So the minute you're a state citizen, state national, or a U.S. citizen, you're part of the militia. So. <laughs> yes, they do. The FBI doesn't, but they're not government. The FBI is a private for-profit corporation without a corporate charter. Do you know they have no authority to even exist? I have a letter from the Library of Congress that said the FBI was created by a secretary at the Department of Justice, a secretary that was not appointed by the president, nor appointed by the head of the Department of Justice, nor by Congress. Therefore, they have no authority to make law and a secretary created the FBI in 1908 to protect the deep state. They, have, they, they follow up on six basic crimes that the deep state commits to cover up crimes for the deep state. And I don't care if this is on video to the whole freaking world, all right? <laughs> they have no corporate charter to even exist, and when they asked Congress for one, they were denied. See, you know what gives the FBI authority? They walk in with their suit and tie and the best forensics in the whole world, and they walk up to the sheriff, and they intimidate the shit out of him. And they say, we're taking over the case. And they do it with authority. And the sheriff goes, okay, it's yours. The sheriff, the sheriff could deny that, though, too. Yes, he could. He, he could tell him to get the hell out of his county. Yeah. But he doesn't, mm -hmm. because he's weak because he didn't have any law classes kindergarten through 12th grade either. I'm serious. They don't, know, they don't know their job. You know who comes in the sheriff's departments and trains the sheriffs and their deputies? The county attorney. The county attorney trains them. 
I'm telling you, attorneys run everything in this country. They run all the police departments. That's why it says police on the side of their car. It's policy, revenue, enforcement, collection agent. That's all they are. They have no, no de jure authority at all. They're de facto. None. Government operates through the consent of the government. Since governments have chosen to incorporate themselves, they must follow the same rules as any other corporation. That rules, codes, statutes, and ordinances are not law, they're corporate bylaws. They're for employees of the corporation to follow. So they make you a citizen, or by your own consent and agreement, and therefore you're an employee of government, so you gotta follow the same rule they do. You gotta follow all the statutes and all the rules and all the policies and all the codes and everything else because you're an employee. You're no different than them. Yet the United States Code was written and passed by we the people through our legislator to hold our public service accountable and they at the Department of Justice come after you and they write a whole bunch of United States Code in there that they're holding you accountable for this code and this code and this code and you, oh shoot, I'm in trouble. Call a lawyer. And then you go to jail, and they put you in jail because of these codes. These codes don't even apply to a man or a woman. They don't apply to a free man. They don't apply to a state national at all. As a state national, you have limited diplomatic immunity as long as you don't kill somebody, rape them, beat them over the head with something. Okay? Unless you injure another party, there's no crime. Okay? This is where we got to wake up. Whew, I get a little revved up, don't I? <laughs> What is this? What I'm looking for is, it's, uh, it's, it's de jure. It's de jure. What is United States? Yes, it is de facto. De facto is without fact. Juris is right law. De jure, jure is right. So the one our rights, okay. Now, this is a corporation. It is a subsidiary corporation of the District of Columbia. The District of Columbia is a subsidiary corporation of the Crown Inc. Okay. Hmm? The Crown Inc. It is DC is its own city, nation, state. Manhattan Island is its own city, nation, state. Westminster is its own city, nation, state, and the Vatican is its own city, nation, state. These are called the four pillars. All right. And so Manhattan is part of that four pillar, right? Manhattan is not. Manhattan is owned by the United Nations, which is owned by the Crown. And it actually goes through a chain. The Council of Foreign Relations, yep. the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, <coughs> the United Nations, the Crown. Ultimately, all of those are owned by the Pindar. It's on the dollar. It's the all-seeing eye. There's 13 blocks here. This is the Council of 13. There's 300 blocks here. It's the Council of 300. If I drew a dashed line right here and I drew a line down from there representing corporations going from the bottom to the top, as people rise to a position of power and authority, they get corrupted. They start committing the seven deadly sins. They are now controlled by the Council of 300. Council of 300 is controlled by the Council of 13, which is controlled by the Pindar. The Pindar used to be the Queen of England, the Queen of Holland, and the Vatican. Pope Benedict removed the Vatican from the Pindar. It's the Queen of England, the Queen of Holland, and TVM. Now, he is not the rightful person to belong in that position. He will be removed, and I believe he has been removed but I don't have confirmation on it yet. Ben Benedict did a lot of great things for the world, right in his last few days, okay? Yes, absolutely. He did, in fact, 
He literally dissolved all corporations in the world, is what he did. Yes, because when you look at corporations, this is an interesting thing. You go start a corporation, right? ABC company, I don't care what it is. You register it with the state. It's now under the state's corporation. It's a subsidiary corporation. The state's under the United States corporation, which is under DC's, which is under the crown. Your corporation's under the crown. Every corporation in the world is tied together as one. This is why when people kind of mistakenly say a person is an entity or a corporation is not. A person is a vessel. The vessel. And the vessel is registered with the state. Okay? But we're really a ship. Let me clarify that for just a second. International waters are what? Shipping, right? In, yeah. Maritime. Maritime. Open to inland piracy. Okay, when you're a vessel, you're in international waters. That's why the high water marks in, uh, at the top of the mountain in Colorado. We're all, <laughs> we're all underwater. <laughs> okay, Christ says, walk upon the water, follow me, have faith, and I'll teach you to be the fishers of men and be able to feed the whole village. He's teaching us to take dominion over commerce when he says that. When Moses when he taught Moses to part the waters and walk upon the land, he was teaching him to take dominion over the land. The Bible is a wonderful thing, and you, once you start learning what I'm teaching you, you start reading it in a whole new light. Okay? Well, that's, now it just makes me want to read the Bible. Instead of reading it to be church, I want to read it to find the facts. That's right. That's because right. Everything it is that I'm full. understanding now as I get deeper into the pedophilia and deeper into all the other stuff, it all reverts back to scripture. It is full of trust indentures. Where he tells someone, you, this is your land, the land of Canaan, it's yours. It's for the benefit of your heirs forever. Right? Well, that's a trust indenture. Okay? All through the Bible are written trust indentures. The very first one is Genesis 1, 26 through 2, 25. It's a trust indenture. It has all elements of a trust in that first book, first and second book of the Bible. And it's God, as the executor, giving me, man, dominion over the land, the air, and the water, and everything therein, and telling me to manage it for the benefit of humanity, of our heirs, to, uh, for, the, for the future forever. What is the legal definition of the word forever? It's until the end of the earth. Forever is until the end of the earth. Then it becomes eternity. Right, it's in perpetuity forever. No one can take that dominion away from me. So once I establish dominion, guess what? No one can take that dominion away from me. No judge can take it. Nobody. I could just kick his ass. If I wanted to create a business that makes money, I would create a business that's a PMA. Why? Because I have more control over it and less regulation over it. Okay? Makes sense. That's why I would do it. I would create a private membership association. Everybody that walks through the door becomes a member. Okay? When you have a private membership association, you don't have to register it with the state. You're never under the jurisdiction of the state. You're under the jurisdiction of all members. So Gina's gymnasium up here, it's a child's gymnasium in Logan. Every child that pays $29.95 a month, a dollar a month goes towards their membership fee. They're members. Little sign on the front door, not open to the public, open to all members. They, they walk in, they pay them every month's dues. It includes a $1 membership fee. All their employees are member owners of the business. What I've said here is the, state, the United States of America is de jure. The United States is de facto. The state of Utah which is who the governor is in charge of, 
is a corporation with its corporate charter held at 44 Northwest Congress Avenue, Washington, D.C. It's not even in the Utah. So you have Utah, a state national would be a Utahan who runs his own de jure government of Utah. He's self-governed. The governor runs the state as the way this nation's corporations were set up. They only have control over their agencies, not over you. But because you claim to be a citizen, you're part of their agencies. So she thinks she can mandate her employees. This is how she's getting away with it, or he's getting away with it. It's a woman in my state. Technically, she's only supposed to tell her agents what to do. So you have to stand up and say, wait a minute, I'm not acting as an agent. I'm acting as a we the people. You can only tell your agencies what to do. You can't force me to do it. This is why they're running this test right now. They're looking to see how many people are going to comply. They put cameras everywhere for this event. Do you know that? Yeah. All your street lights have cameras. Everywhere's cameras. They're also training their cameras yes. for facial recognition of your eyes. Yeah. Your retinal scan. Yes. It's blocking this part of your face on purpose so the computer learns how to recognize just That's your eyes. The NLA wrote a very good comprehensive constitutional sheriff's handbook. You can go to their website. You can, yep, yeah, you can buy it. You can donate money to them. And as the money comes in, they send out hundreds of copies. So they'll send them out for you if you just donate to them and pay for them. They'll send them out. They're trying to get them to every police force, every sheriff. They started with the county sheriffs. Every county sheriff in this country now has one. Now they're working on police forces. They're trying to get them in the hands of every deputy. They want the deputies to have them. You know why they want the deputies to have them? They want them to take them home and night, set them on their coffee table and then pick them up occasionally and read them. And that way the deputies decide Am I being ordered to do something that I'm not supposed to be doing? Well, understand this, okay, right now. None of these cities, police forces, take an oath to the Constitution. That's what they None of them do. And they're at the behest of the mayor. The only ones that take an oath are the counties, the county sheriffs, the county deputies. None of the city police forces take an oath. You have to request the sheriff. Mm -hmm. That's right, that's right. If a police, a city police pulls you over, starts giving you a hard time, you say, hold on a minute, I'm calling the sheriff. And you call your county sheriff and you say, hey, as a member of your county, I am having a problem right now with a city deputy. Can you come help? And you gotta recognize that cop's not gonna let you get on that phone. No, he's, he's gonna. gonna try to stop you. Yeah. He's going to try to assert every bit of power and make you in fear. Before they talk to you, they try to pass your phone away. Look. Well, they'll tell you to put your phone down. Here, here's the thing. We're supposed to know who we are. We're supposed to be at peace until we're backed into a corner. We don't let anyone override us. We are the boss. They can override us. Now, I'm not saying go out and declare war on them because that's the wrong thing to do. They will kill you, guarantee it, okay? But be at peace. Fly the peace flag. The dash of my pickup has a peace flag right in the passenger's corner. Because nowadays the police are walking up to that side of the car most of the time, okay? Do they even understand what that is? Because I have no idea. What I don't care if they understand it or not. Most of them are ex-military officers. Most police officers, yes. the police, Departments want to hire a low IQ ex-Army officers. Why? Because the Army officers at the lower ranks follow orders to the T. <laughs> 
So they're already programmed. They do not want high IQ officers. In fact, I know guys who have gone to the academy who are pretty smart and intelligent and were smart enough if they wanted to be a cop to miss questions on purpose so that they could get their badge. Now that sounds terrible, but that's what they want. They want lower IQ order followers. Ones that when they give an order to follow a policy, when the county attorney walks in or the city attorney walks in and trains the officers in the police department how to collect revenue, it's all their training. Statute is about revenue. How to collect revenue, they want them to follow those orders. They don't want them to think for themselves. And that's pretty darn sad. Makes me mad. Okay. Because there's a lot of good guys, a lot of good guys who are cops. But I've seen my share of bad ones too. I absolutely want to create a legal business. I want to create a legal business for one purpose only. Because they try to force you to stick in uh, corporations. No, it's because we have to take dominion over all three jurisdictions. So if I start a business, ABC Inc., I don't care what it's called. I've had one for since 1982 called Straight Enterprises, but that tells you how old I am. All right. ABC Inc. It has to have the intent to make a profit. It has to be registered with the state. Now, when I register it with the state, I want it to clearly state that it has the intent to make a profit and that it's going to have products offered for sale in international commerce. International. Just put it in the notes section at the bottom. Yes, <laughs> this is a key. Okay, international commerce. Now, that usually requires a website or some way to get your product out there. Does it, it has to have an offering, an offering. So a product offered for sale, a product. Product or a service or just a product? Well, for the purpose of this, I'm gonna tell you a product, not a service. And I'll tell you why. Now, you see this bag right here? It says Costco Wholesale on it. That's a trademark name. Costco Wholesale is a trademark name. They placed it on a product offered for sale in international commerce with the intent to make a profit. Very key. So again, think Michael Jordan and Nike for just a minute. I like to use that because I'm pretty proud of the guy. If you can get a billion dollars over a five year period, 200 million a year for the use of your name, give it to him. <laughs> Sign the contract. That's a pretty good gig if you can get it. So if I took my children's names and my grandchildren's names and my name, and I, what I mean by that is the all caps name, the vessel, and I trademark them all, doing a bulk trademark under ABC Inc. with the United States Patent and Trademark Office on their T's plus form. telling you how to do this right now. So go to their website, do the, it's an online form, so you sit there on your T's plus form, and you put your all caps names of you and your kids, register them as trademarks, 
under your corporation. Now, let's just say I take my kid and I, I'll just throw one of my daughter's names up here. And I take my kid, her full name's trademarked, and I put her name, well, first of all, I sign a contract with ABC Inc. and her with her signatory officer, officer, and I sign a contract, offering her 20% of the profits. And then I print her name on some bags, or some t-shirts, or some pens, or whatever. I don't care. Make magnetic signs, stick them on the side of your car. I don't care what you do. But then I take, let's say I go buy a half a dozen different color t-shirts. There's a reason I'm telling you t-shirts. And I lay them out on a white sheet at home on the bed, and I take a picture of them, and I put them on the website, and I offer them for sale for $20 plus. Yes, there's a reason for the $20. So I offer these t-shirts for sale for $20.05, I don't care, all right? I've got a contract with the business, got her trademark names on t-shirts, something happens and my grandkids' names, and she has five kids now, by the way. I tell her I'm way too young to be a grandfather with five kids from one of my youngest daughters, okay? And she lives in Utah. All right. <laughs> so I put their names on this T-shirt, right? Now we got a problem at the court, or they want to steal her kids. I throw that T-shirt on, I walk into court with their trademark names, and I don't talk about the facts of the case or anything. I talk about her status, her standing, her jurisdiction, how she's taken dominion over all three jurisdictions, the land, the air, and the water. And I say, Judge, do you really think you should be interfering in commerce? Do you really think you should be infringing upon a trademark? How about right now we just demand the return of our property and any document that you've placed that name upon without our prior written express permission be destroyed. See, he's really worried right now because he opened himself up to a great deal of liability. Once we've explained and notified him with a proper notice called a notice of appearance of how we were going to appear by special appearance, under what status, having taken dominion of our three jurisdictions, he's already been notified in law, which we've already recorded it with the county, made that document a court of record, and we filed it upon the court case, and then we walk into a hearing, because Lady Justice has two ears and must hear, and now we just ask for summary judgment. We demand the return of our property. We have all documents destroyed and the case dismissed. And we all go home happy, and it takes me 15 minutes or so. Okay. This you're is- You're talking above a level. He understands what you're saying, but he's like, holy smoke. Oh, he's scared in his I boots. See, see, the difference is most people walk into a courtroom and they're shaking, and they're scared, and they're afraid, and they're timid. I walk in smiling, skipping, how you doing? <laughs> I want the prosecutor and I want the judge shaking. I want them shaking in their boots, wondering what the hell I know and what I'm up to. So I walk in there with a whole different attitude. I own the place the minute I walk in. No okay. I'm at peace, but I'm prepared to out-debate them. And that's all it is, is knowledge eliminates your fear. The only fear 
is from lack of knowledge. If you're scared of mountain climbing or rock climbing or hang gliding, it's because you don't know all the aspects of it. You haven't taken all the safety precautions. I just dropped a parachute off and ran off the side of the Grand Canyon, landed at the ranch below and rode the donkeys up. It's called base jumping, it's a blast, okay? So when you planned it out, you're not afraid. In the courts, you shouldn't be afraid in a courtroom. It's just having a little bit of knowledge. What you've learned and are going to learn this weekend, if you prepare yourself with the proper documents ahead of time, you shouldn't be as scared of going to court ever again in your life. Now, they're gonna try things. They're gonna try and throw out constitutional bear traps for you to step in and get them wrapped around your ankles. And they're gonna try and get you to say more than is necessary. See, you gotta learn what to say and then learn how to shut up. Anything you say can and will be used against you. So when I, I a lot of people are, man, they just rattle off, rattle off and hang themselves. The key is, and we're gonna talk about dynamic negotiation. We're gonna talk about what that means, okay? But the key is to throw something out there, ask them a question. In the form of a question is always better. Don't try not to make statements, throw it out there in the form of a question. Now when you're taking authority, you make statements. When you're getting that put, placing the burden of proof upon them, you're asking questions. And the burden of proof's always on them. Okay? So you shut up. I know a guy that was just walking down the street, not minding his own business, not doing nothing. This cop car pulls up and is like pacing him as he's walking down the sidewalk. The guy, the cop finally rolled his window down, asked him to stop. And the guy's looking at him like, what did I do, right? And the cop asked him to sit on the ground. It's ridiculous. I can't okay? No, no you don't. Okay. Gosh, I'd be have to show up and bail you out again. <laughs> don't do dumb things, all right? These guys are just people, don't have any fear, just don't say anything that's necessary. So anyway, this cop started to ask him all these questions. I don't answer questions. On the advice of counsel, I don't answer questions. Cop says, what is your name? And at that point, after saying I don't answer questions and on the advice of counsel, I don't answer questions, that's notice number one, notice number two. Cop says, what is your name? He zipped his lip. Well, this young aggravated cop who was looking for somebody that might meet that description, who might have robbed a Circle K down the street, puts him in his cop car and puts handcuffs on him. And all the way to the station, the cop was trying to get him to answer questions. And he just smiled and shut up, didn't say a word. They take him to the police station, they put him in her little room, they come in, they start asking him questions. He just shuts up, doesn't say a word, doesn't give him his name, doesn't give him his address, doesn't give him anything. After about an hour and a half, the police got pretty darn fed up and tired and they let him out the door and he went home. That's a good scenario. Did you him? Hmm? Nah, he didn't. It's not worth. Sometimes you got to judge whether it's worth it an effort, right? But the fact is, they could have done a lot more. He could have told them his name, told them his address. They, they, you know, people just say things that they don't even think incriminates them, and it does. There's some good videos on YouTube. You probably ought to watch. The Pop Brothers do a really good job. Look up the Pop Brothers. Yeah, P.O.T. There are a couple of attorneys in Denver, Colorado, when they legalized pot in, in Colorado, 
uh, uh, they, they help people get out of trouble. But they do it for a number of different reasons, just not pot. I mean, traffic stops, all kinds of things. And they tell you to shut the fuck up, basically. Okay? That's exactly how they say it. But they're, when you pull up one of their videos, over on the side, they usually have related videos. And I've seen some very good related videos that they didn't even do that are there. And they're usually from attorneys telling people how they incriminate themselves. So the number one thing we do to get in trouble is run our mouths. One of the problems you have in Utah, and I'm going to tell you this, I, over the last 20 years, have helped a lot of cases in this state. Too high of a percentage. When there's 50 states that I work in, and I look at the number of cases I've had in Utah, I just, hmm, start to wonder why, right? Well, the problem is this, is you got the, probably the world's biggest good old boy network right here. And they all go to church with each other on Sunday. <laughs> and that's what I'm saying about this. You want to take dominion over the water? Just make up some t-shirts, offer them for sale on the internet. Write your contracts. Michael Jordan wrote a contract with Nike for five years, one billion dollars, 200 million a year. And a police officer couldn't even write Michael Jordan's name on a ticket without the prior express written permission of Nike. So if they can't get ABC Inc's permission, ahead of time to write Krish's name or one of her kids on their documents, that document must be destroyed. Title 15 of the United States Code becomes your savior at that point. Title 15 regulates commerce. And it says they can regulate commerce, but they can't interfere in it. Remember yesterday, I sat here for a second, we were talking about court, and I said the minute they call my name and I stand up and I take my first step, I'm already talking. I'm here by special appearance, calling for a constitutional court of record to ask for a summary judgment of the truth and the facts placed upon the record by my documents. And then I shut up. I've already told them in my documents how I'm gonna appear, what my status is, everything. Now I just told them I'm by special appearance so that I don't turn over jurisdiction. There's only two ways to appear in court for those who weren't here yesterday, by general appearance or by special appearance. By general appearance, you're turning over jurisdiction to them. You're already consenting right off the bat. <coughs> by special appearance, you're not. Okay, that's it. So once you do that, you really shouldn't have to say anything more. Now you're probably going to. They're going, probably going to ask some questions, trying to throw out some constitutional bear traps to get you to step in and things like that to prevail. So you got to be careful and listen to every little word they said because they, they got trickery down to a mastery. Okay, they really do. But the main thing is we run our mouth and then we get in trouble. But once you do that, if you've already put your documents in and they're a court of record, see if they're not a, made a court of record, they can throw your documents out, they can do, ignore them, they can say they're frivolous, they can do whatever the hell they want to. They're administrating them because they're nothing more than a letter. But once they're a court of record, they're already a subtle matter. You see? Can notarize them and record it with the court. With the county. Court. Publicly published. See, that's the thing about publicly publishing something. Once it's publicly published, there's no way to pull it back. If you look on this document, steps to take, number 11, you must claim your minor estate. This is going to take some time for me to explain. So what does it mean to claim your minor estate? Yesterday, and for those that weren't here, I'm just going to draw it a little bit on the board. In 1882, Congress set up the Public Charitable Trust. That was an umbrella trust. 
That's all it is, an umbrella trust. Underneath the public charitable trust is everybody's SESTA QV trust. It's That's how it's spelled, SESTA QV. Okay, it's an individual trust, so our last census, I think there was 337 million people in the United States that all had a SESTA QV trust under the Public Charitable Trust. So again, how this nation works, how it's funded off our system of slavery is this. <clears throat> We're born and a balance sheet is created. There's a debit side and a credit side. I'm just gonna write, here I'll just write one mil in here. We're bonded for a million dollars. What does that mean? On the debit side, one million dollars is borrowed from the International Monetary Fund and it's thrown out into the banks to the public under the Public Charitable Trust based upon you being born based upon your birth registration. Your birth certificate is a bond, it's on bond paper, it's got a bank name, it's, it's got a CUSIP number. CUSIP number is a number, it's an investment control number regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission. <clears throat> At one of the 12 Federal Reserve Banks, you have a bank account. Mine, Starts with a C, which means it's in Cleveland. Okay. I know what my bank routing number is, and I know what my bank account number is, which is my CUSIP number. So I know the routing number of that Federal Reserve Bank. Is it CUSIP? C U S I P. C U S I P. Okay. So a million dollar loan from the IMF is sent out into the public and one million dollars on the other side of the balance sheet of United States Treasury bonds are issued. So you became, become the full faith and credit of the United States government. Part of it anyway. One of 337 million others, okay? And you become the creditor on one side and the debtor on the other. Do you know that's determined by your status? If you claim the status of we the people, a state national, you're a creditor. If you're a U.S. citizen, you are a debtor. <laughs> That and which one creates, one controls. We the people created the U.S. government. U.S. government created the U.S. citizen. Okay? So our job in life, once we turn 18, is to go out there and earn some money and spend it. So we buy a house, 200000 we buy a car, or two or three. We buy some utilities and some medical bills and some food and all kinds of crap. And that goes on the debit side because these notes in our pockets, in our wallets, are legal tender. This debt is kept track of by the bean counters of the Department of Fiscal Services via your W-4s, your tax returns, your 1040s, your credit card statements, your bank statements, everything you spend is kept track of, okay? And it goes on the debit side. Now in the meantime, this in initial investment of this $1 million is bundled, invested, hypothecated, sold on the New York Stock Exchange, sold to companies all over the world. 
This gentleman just put his CUSIP number off his birth certificate into GMEI Utility a few minutes ago, right before we started, <coughs> and saw a whole bunch of companies that are buying and selling him under his unique account number. 10,000 10, companies? Okay. Buying and selling him right now. All this debt is kept track of. This investment keeps growing. Let's just say it grows to 100 million. And you die. It goes through probate. This is the death line. And they take the money out of this account. And let's just say they take 10 million out and it's now 90 million. And they pay off this and now the balance is zero. And they pay the loan back to the IMF, all the legal tender, they pay back. All your debts now get discharged finally. <laughs> and they pay it all back. And now the balance is zero. This still has 90 million in it now. What do they do with it? They just roll it over. United States Treasury bonds, full faith and credit of the government. Yeah, the balance remains the same for perpetuity, forever. So my dad, who died in 1989, I can punch into his CUSIP numbers. Companies are still buying and selling him. He's already gone through probate. All of this side's a zero balance for him. But all the money that's in there stays the same forever. But it continues to grow, right? Do you know what a sweep account is? Okay, if you go into your bank, I don't care, Wells Fargo down the street, and you open a checking account and a savings account at the same time, and you say, I want to designate my account, my checking account, as a sweep account. A sweep account. Now, you go write a check out of your checking account to your utility company for 97 bucks for your monthly utility. The bank, takes a hundred out of your checking account and throws three dollars into your savings account. People look at it like a forced savings plan. They just round it up, take it out. It's kind of what happens here. This stays the same forever. Let's say this year it makes another 10 million. The government sweeps that off and it funds government. It's an off-book fund. So if you look at the government's budget, about that much of their budget, that little slice of pie, comes from all the income taxes and taxes paid and all the tariffs on goods and services. All the rest of this comes out of people's SESTA QV trust. Everyone who's died since 1933 is currently funding government today. Now here's part of the problem right here. I'm going to break this down a little bit farther. One more step. And part of it, a big part of it, is collected out of your CUSIP while you're still alive. How do they do that? They bring you up on charges. What is a court? A court is a bank. A court is a post office. If you get indictment, at the bottom of the indictment, it says a true bill. If you don't pay the bill, you're brought up on charges. If you don't pay the charges, you're asked to bond. If you don't pay the bond, your body is held as surety while they steal from your trust. Your court case number is a CUSIP number, and it attaches to your main CUSIP number of your birth certificate, and it's a way to get paid from your account. And so it's based upon the penal sum and the net retentions. So if the penal sum, like a, you get a felony count of fraud, it's penal sum is two million. The judge gets 95,000 in net retention or commission. The prosecutor gets 50,000 commission. They share some of that with the defense attorney and it's a three-way conspiracy to conspire to arrest you for, so they can get paid off a penal sum. And they take 2 million, 95 and 50, out of your account, okay? Now another way 
is say, take your kids. Yesterday I said every kid is worth 3.3 million. They take your kids, they take one and a half million out of the mother's Sesta QV Trust, they take one and a half million out of the father's Sesta QV Trust. Right off the top. This Sesta QV Trust is our minor estate. It was put into place when we were a minor. A baby comes out of the water, is tugged through the birth canal, is docked at the dock by the dock tender, the doctor, where a bill of lading is received. It's sent with the tug out to sea, presumed dead, lost at sea, until it returns to claim its minor estate. After the sole print has been taken, they take the sole plate, the prints, footprints of the baby, that's taking its soul, so it's dead and lost at sea. They take the placenta and they take the soul plate, thereby taking the baby's soul. It's kind of a sick way to think of it, but that's how the, uh, the original SESTA QV Act of 1666 in England was developed. The SESTA QV Act in England was written in 1666. Coincidence? Doubt it. We adopted it in 1933, th almost 300 years later. This is our minor estate. We must lay claim to it. Now the problem is most of the time we go to court, we're going to these lower courts that don't mean diddly squat, that really don't have really any authority to rule over us, except they say they do and we consent, okay? And we go into them and they can't really do anything about this anyway. So what we're doing is we're just putting them on notice that we claim our minor estate. We take ownership of our birth certificates. We do that through the deeds of reconveyances. There's other ways to do it too. You can take your birth certificate, write a declaration claiming the ownership and filing that on the land. Good thing to do, notify them. So every time we write a court document, when we write our notice of appearance, which should be the very first document that goes into any court case, telling them how we're going to appear, what our status is, how we've taken dominion, we're just showing up to settle the matter. In that document, we should always put in a claim to the minor estate. Now they can't do anything about it. but it's putting them on notice that we're claiming it, okay? Your documents become a court of record when they're properly served, publicly published, and filed. Always do everything in writing. Back it up with your words. See, the only thing you should have to say out of your mouth is, I'm here by special appearance, calling for a constitutional court of record, asking for a summary judgment of the truth and fact placed upon the record by my court of record, my documents. And then you should shut up. Yeah. See, here's one of the problems. Almost always in the story of a mother, which you guys missed yesterday too, the story of a mother, I'm gonna hit it really fast, a mother, nine months pregnant, walks into a foundling hospital. The legal definition of the word foundling is a safe place to abandon a child. All hospitals, police stations, fire stations, and churches in the United States were designated as foundling. So you can walk in with a baby, set it down on the floor, smile, walk out with no consequences. None. All hospitals were designated that. So you go into the birthing ward, become a ward of the state. That's what you do. You walk into the birthing ward, you deliver the baby out of the water, becomes a vessel, it gets registered. You're handed a stack of paperwork to fill out and in the nurse's manual it says, this is just to register your baby with the state and give it a name. That's a quote right out of the nurse's manuals. Nobody's securities license, nobody's insurance license, nobody's given you a prospectus, nobody's told you the terms and conditions of the contract. The mother's under duress, she's under the influence of painkillers, she's not legally able to even sign a contract, and she signs that, fills that paperwork out and signs as an informant. 
The legal definition of the word informant is someone who gives someone else up to another, thereby giving title and equity of the child to the state. It forms the doctrine of parents patriae, where the state is the parent. You see how sick and wrong this really is? Then CPS can kick down your door with a police officer, take your kid, run you through a bunch of hoops, terminate your parental rights, do whatever the state wants them to do, and then sell your child. And they do it all the time. See, under the Public Charitable Trust Act, you are the co-trustee, co-beneficiary, and the only signatory officer. This is why it takes three signatures to put a person in jail. This is why I explained this yesterday. It takes the judges, it takes the prosecutors, and it takes either yours or your attorneys. That's why you don't get power of attorney to an attorney, because he'll sign you away. He'll sign you in jail as surety for the bond. Almost every single time. Man, bang head here. Seriously. Well, well, of course. But what is the definition of an attorney? An actor to a turn. An actor gets up on stage and lies convincingly enough to make you believe in the character and the plot, and to a turn is to steal from one and turn over to another. Therefore, a thief. So they're a liar and a thief. That's why God warned us in the Bible. So what is the legal definition of the word legal? The undoing of God's laws. What is legal is not lawful. That's why I read Doctrine and Covenants 98 yesterday. I went right through it. It clearly states, follow the laws of the land which are constitutional. Anything more or less of this cometh of evil. The laws of man. And it's clear crystal clear in there. So you claim your minor estate. Now, that's in 99% of your court cases that you're dealing with right here in the state. But what happens if you're dealing in a federal case? Guess who has the authority to deal with the Department of Fiscal Services, which are the accountants for the United States Treasury, which is the holding account of the Sesta QV Trust for the International Monetary Fund and the Federal Reserve. Guess who has that authority? Mary, the head court clerk in that district. <laughs> Mary has the authority. She can fill out the online forms with the Department of Fiscal Services. Now she needs a judge and a prosecutor and your signature or your attorneys to sign off on it. Now guess what? If I walk in and I make a claim to my minor estate to a federal probate judge or a bankruptcy judge federal bankruptcy judge, he can order Mary with my signature to claim the minor estate. They can file with her? They file? There's forms they can fill out with the Department of Fiscal Services online to put in a claim to my minor estate. <coughs> I have the count number, I have the bank, I have the routing number. I have all the information to give to her. Now you go in there and claim it, are they gonna write a stop? Do they not want you to have access to it? They can't stop you. We're the co-trustee, co-beneficiary, and the only signatory officer. This is just an administrative process. Well, prior to 1999, November of 1999, the United States declared bankruptcy. Prior to that, I'd claimed my minor estate and I had a black credit card in my pocket I could buy a Learjet on. Okay? You did that. Uh, no, I didn't buy a Learjet. <laughs> yeah, I had a black credit card on my account. Linked to my estate at the Federal Reserve, the bank in Cleveland with my account number, the Federal Reserve Bank in Cleveland. Now, in that November of 99, the United States declared bankruptcy. And they attached 
all the SESTA-QV trust to the federal debt, the 25 trillion or whatever is in debt, right? So now I know a few people who have claimed their minor estate since then, and it's really funny that when that paperwork, the day that paperwork goes in, the debt clock goes click and drops 150,000 or so. Their portion of the federal debt got paid off when they claimed their minor estate. So, so we could go wipe out a whole 25 trillion off. It only takes about 150,000 out of our, you know, 100 million that you might have in there. And you're entitled to half of that money. You're the co-trustee, the co-beneficiary, the only signatory officer. If there's 100 million in there, 50 million of it's yours. Now, they have been very, very good money managers. I don't recommend taking it out. I recommend just asking for access and having a checking account on it with a credit card. Now you wanna go buy a house? Go down to Wells Fargo and say, hey, I like that house over there, it's worth 300,000. Just put it on this. Yeah, same with that new Chevy Duramax diesel truck. Put that 75000 on this. If I walk into a Chevy dealership, I happen to like Duramax diesels. I like the crew cab, long bed, fully decked out, LTZ. $75,000, $80,000 trucks, right? If I walk in there with $80,000 or whatever it is, and I lay it down on a table, at that moment in time, I own that truck. But the salesman looks at me and says, give me another $250 for title license registration, please. I say, no, that's okay. I'm going buying it to export to a foreign country. And then he gives me the MCO and MSO after I sign a little statement that I'm buying to export it. And then I get in the truck and I sit down and I roll the seats back. I turn the key and I drive out of the dealership and when I land on the road, I'm exporting it from the state of Oregon to Oregon, a foreign nation. I own the truck as a man. It's private for-profit entity. I'm not gonna use it as an Uber. Now, if I wanted to use one as an Uber, I could file it under my vessel name in international commerce, but then I'd have to license it with the state. Hey, I've walked into federal courthouses and I'd, I've done this. Here, I want to open a federal case under a miscellaneous case number. Here's my $400. I'm going to be filing paperwork later. We'll convert it into a civil or a criminal case. And I walk out. And what's that for? What's they just open a case number. They give me a CUSIP number oh, under a miscellaneous filing for me to do something with later. No, it's a CUSIM number that I can do something with. I control that. So now I can attach that to my birth certificate number, and I can use that to claim my minor estate by calling for a probate judge <gasps> to adjudicate it. And then Mary has to contact the bean counters and find out how much I owe on the debit side and how much I have on the credit side, and that all goes through that probate judge who pays off all, all, the, all the debts, and then whatever's left, I claim half, because half's mine, but I don't want to take it. You just want to keep letting They're good investment managers. They've proven themselves to be good investment managers. Leave it there. What if I get in trouble sometime and I need something to draw on? Now I, now I just walk into court and I settle the matter. Here's my birth certificate, here's my CUSA, here, here's my credit card. Let's settle the matter. What's the penal sum? See, if then if I get indicted. See, here's the problem with an indictment. Everybody gets an indictment. It's got a penal sum. It says right at the bottom is a true bill, which means it's an invoice. And nobody bothers to say, well, how much is the bill? And they don't ask, so 
30 days later, they're brought up on charges. Because they didn't ask how much the bill and they didn't settle the matter. You got the opportunity to settle the matter at the indictment before anything else occurs. But you don't. It's like getting a credit card bill, put it on the fridge, and I'll pay it later, and you forget about it. Right? But the thing, how much would an indictment be? Who sets that number? What are you being charged with? What, how much, what, what crime did they put on the invoice? Is it fraud? A federal case, a felony of fraud is $2 million penal sum. I know that because I fought one of those cases. Four so felony counts of fraud, $8 million bucks. So you'd have to go in there and pay $2 million bucks. That's right. So you just or hand them your okay. credit card. It's got $100 million in your account. Let's take care of that right now. Settle the matter. If you committed the crime, you have the option of fighting it. You can say, I'm, I declare my innocence. I'm not going to pay it. I'm declaring my innocence. Let's go to trial. I think I can convince a jury. I can walk in and establish my status, my standing, my jurisdictions, and I don't think I'm going to lose. Fine. Or you can say, these guys are making $10 million a month on my account. What's two mil? <laughs> No hassle, no problem, I don't have to go to court. Maybe it's worth two mil if you've got 50 mil in the bank. And then again, you the see only, what I mean? The only reason why you could be found or in trouble is if you committed murder or something. Right. So if it's not something right. Murder, and other than that, I have limited diplomatic <laughs> immunity as a state national. Right. Read the Geneva Conventions. We the people, the state nationals, have limited diplomatic immunity as per the Geneva Conventions. Both of them. Sure it is. But who cares? It's a civil matter. It's just a bill. It's just an invoice. They can't hold your body as surety. No sweat off your brow, no time in jail, no three hots in a cot, no blood off your hands. You know? It, if the money doesn't matter that much, they're being good money managers and managing your account. If I know they're going to make $10 million next month, what's two? Let them have it. Let them fund government. I'm not going to pay any income tax. I'm not going to pay any property tax because my own land's in land patent. I'm not going to pay them any fees at the DMV. We are supposed to pay for 19 governmental services. Now, this is a great way to do it. <laughs> See, it's all in how you look at things. It's right here. It's how you look at it. It's just an invoice. Just pay it like you would your light bill. By the way, you can use a credit card for your light bill, too. 90% of the reason you get in trouble is because you say too much. Okay? You be at peace. You take control. You have authority. It's how the FBI operates. The only way they have authority is they wear the suit. And they walk in, and they intimidate everybody. We're taking over. And we've got that brainwash that's, that's right. We're taking over. They don't even have any congressional authority to even exist. No corporate charter. None. We the people can run for office, and when we walk in the door of our office, I'm a state citizen. When I walk out the door of my office and go home, I'm a state national. We the people created government. We run our government. When we serve each other, the people, I'm a citizen. I'm an employee of government. What if you violate that? When I walk in. With an emoluments violation is the only way you can violate that. That means I step outside of my scope and authority. And then you, as another state national, can hold me accountable as a state citizen. But not as Mm -hmm. You have to hold me accountable as a state citizen. It's we the people's job to self-govern, to watch our elected public officials and to call them out for the things they do wrong. What did I tell you our two jobs were yesterday? We only have two jobs in life. That's it. Correct the errors our public servants make and to educate them so they don't do it again. That's it. The rest of the time we could be fishing.
camping, hunting, riding motorcycles, whatever you want to do. Well, yesterday they arrested Millie, uh, uh, Millie thank you, Millie Weaver, couldn't think of, her last name just went through my head, yesterday, showed up at her house, right in front of her kids, arrested her, they didn't have a warrant, they didn't have their indictment, they didn't have nothing, and she just went with them. I wouldn't even open the freaking door. I would have told them to get the hell off the property and quit trespassing against me. If you want to talk to me, you come back with a warrant. That warrant, and I'm going to tell it to them like this, it better be from an Article 1 or an Article 3 court. It better have a raised court seal. It better have a wedding signature of a judge. It better be backed up by a claim or affidavits or testimony sworn under the penalty of perjury that I did something wrong, and then I'll go answer for it. But if not, it ain't worth the paper it's written on, and I'm going to light it on fire right at your feet. And I will. I'll whip out a cigarette lighter, and I'll light it on fire, and I'll drop it right in front of me. And say, come back when you have a real warrant. Because if a warrant isn't backed up by a claim, an affidavit, or a sworn testimony, it's not a real warrant. If it doesn't have a raised court seal, it's not a real warrant. These faxed over... I got a case in Montana, an FBI signed a, agent signed a judge's name on it. I have the judge's signature. I can look at the two and go, <laughs> not even close, right? This is what we got to do. We got to have some knowledge so that we know what to say. Is this also where your castle doctrine, so that you can, does that have anything Absolutely. To do with it? That's what I'm thinking, is they can't just come in and take you away. You can defend your... Since governments have chosen to incorporate themselves, they must follow the same rules as any other corporation. That is right out of a Supreme Court case. So are you telling me a guy wearing a Walmart t-shirt can show up at my house and throw me in jail? Neither can the police officer from the city of Riverton. He's a private for-profit entity. He's not government. He's de facto. He's acting as a governmental services corporation. As a lawful agent? No. no. A legal agent. He's not lawful. He's acting as a legal agent. A legal agent is unlawful. It's color of law. So under Title 18, Section 242, he's depriving me of my rights under the color of law. He can't do that. Sorry, buddy. Repeat the title again. Title 18, Section 242. If two or more come, let's just say he comes with a CPS agent to take my kids. If two or more come, it's Title 241. It's a conspiracy to deprive me of my rights under the color of law. He can't do that either. I love the U.S. Code. I could probably come up with 130 codes on average that are all felonies, that all carry a quarter of a million dollar fine and one to 10 years in prison per count of crimes that they're committing coming over to talk to me. I'm saying make it your friend. Sleep with that puppy. Okay, read it every waking moment you got until you learn it. Because the United States Code was put there for one reason, one reason only. That's for we the people to hold our public servants accountable. It's not for them to hold you accountable. The only reason they do is because you claim to be a citizen, so you're one of them. You just made yourself one of them. <laughs> What's that? A lot. Okay, let's talk about that for just a minute. You look at Title 26 of the United States Code, that's the Internal Revenue Service Code. You guys want to learn something about taxes for a second? In Title 26 of the United States Code, it says no part of this title, not its headings, nor its body, nor its footnotes, nor its definitions, shall be construed as law. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? All right, I'll say it again. In Title 26, it says, no part of this title, not its headings, nor its body, nor its footnotes, nor its definitions, shall be construed as law. 
That's the IRS code. So none of it's enforced? It sure is. They send you a letter and you comply. Equity. Equity. They, you, they say you must fill out this 1040 form and you believe them and you sign it and you send it in. Thanks for the gift. <laughs> Read the books written by former heads of the IRS. It's funny. In every book written by every former head of the IRS, and every one of them writes a book, you can buy them at Barnes and Nobles, okay? They say, we're not really sure why anyone pays the income or wage tax. Because what was a 1040? Abraham Lincoln put the 1040 bonds made them available during the Civil War so that people could support the troops, support the war efforts, and gift money to the government to fund the war. And we just never quit gifting. Rather than, rather than borrow it. Yeah, rather than borrow it. So we just never quit gifting. I talked about this yesterday, but you, it's okay. You notify the IRS through a Form 56 of what you are, your status. Under Title 26 of the IRS Code, which isn't law, there's a definition in there that you can claim to be a foreign, a state, and or trust. Well, here's an interesting paragraph. It's not what I was looking at, but it's, it's pretty interesting. In 1979 edition of the 22 USCA 278, the United Nations, you will find Executive Order 10422. The Office of Personnel Management is under the direction of the Secretary of the United Nations pursuant to Treasury Delegation Order Number 91. The IRS entered a service agreement with the United States Treasury Department as their collection agency. See Public Law 94564, Legislative History, page 5967. Reorganization Bankruptcy Plan Number 26 in the Agency for International Development. This is what talks about our federal government being under bankruptcy, be under, being under the jurisdiction of the Army, under the Army Field Manual. Field Manual? The Ar Army Field Manual. Uh, and at that time, it was from 1969, Army Field Manual. But it shows that the IRS is an agency member of the 169, at that time, nations, pact called the International Crime Police Organization, or Interpol. Oh, wow. That's found at 22 USCA 263A, the Memorandum of Understanding between the Secretary of Treasury, EKA, the Corporate Governor of the Fund, and the Bank, which is the International Monetary Fund and the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. So that's the fund name and the bank name indicated that the Attorney General and his associates are soliciting and collecting information for foreign principles. The International Organizations, Corporations, and Associates exemplified by 22 U.S.C. 286F. This document that I'm looking at right now, this is my affidavit of repudiation. I wrote this document. And the majority of this document, having been changed to fit the person that I gave it to, printed it. He's a jurat doctorate. His name is Melvin Stamper. And he and I worked together on his book, Fruit from a Poisonous Tree, which has been a New York Times bestseller. It's in, been used in just about every courtroom. It's set the doctrine of fruit from a poisonous tree. And <clears throat> My affidavit's pay, uh, chapter two of his book, pretty much, okay? So these are, uh, this affidavit has probably been put in by about 40,000 people. <laughs> so, it's gotta fit you, it's gotta be yours. Anytime you take anyone's document, as I said yesterday, and you make it yours, 
it has to fit your situation, otherwise you're committing a felony under the penalty of perjury. Did you know the US adopted the common laws of England with the Constitution? <coughs> Anybody know that? Well, okay. No, because we're not taught. Did, did they realize? All right, <laughs> here's what I was looking for. 26 USC 7701A31 is a tax-exempt foreign estate and or trust. So what I do is I use a Form 56, I notify the IRS that I am under that title of their code, which isn't law, but they go by it. Doesn't apply to me, but they go by it. And that notifies them that that's what I am. And then if I wanted to go work at an employer, when I went to their HR department, I would fill out a W-8-B-E-N. W-8-B-E-N. W-8-B-E-N instead of a W-4. Okay, cool. Now what is that? And under the W-8-B-E-N, I'm tax exempt. So I get 100% of my paycheck. Yes, you do. And then you don't have to file a 1040 or anything else because you're a tax exempt foreign estate and or trust. And they know it. It's on record. Claim your minor estate. That's what all this has been about. And I think we can all do it. Just go do it. I know a lady in California that has had a case going in federal court. And she heard one of my talks somewhere where I talked about this. She. I didn't even know her from Adam. She got it off the internet, right? She went into a court in California in a federal court case and she stood up and claimed her minor account. She appointed the court clerk as a trustee of her account. She authorized the court clerk by her signature to hire any professionals that she may need necessary, such as a probate judge or a bankruptcy judge to claim her minor estate, and she asked for half. She walked out of the courtroom with a check for $45 million. Oh my God. That's after they settled it, all her debts and everything. $45 million, she got a check. I wouldn't recommend that. I recommend, that, let them manage it. Yeah, they're gonna keep on and adding more too. Oh, they, exactly. they, they have the ability to hypothecate. And that's a rare, wonderful thing. I wish I could hi hypothecate all my investments. <laughs> well, I'll put it this way. I know a guy that took $100 million and he hypothecated it, and in 10 days, it was worth $1.2 Good job if you can get it. There's only a few people in the world allowed to do that. One of them's the federal government. It's to bundle and sell and bond in advance. I don't know the whole ins and outs of the whole thing, but they bundle, sell, and bond in advance, and they sell it very quickly. Like they'll trade it every few minutes on the stock exchange. And ju it just turns into more and more and more and more and more and more money all the time. And they can do it really fast. Yeah, it's crazy. This is the person that has the access. There's 12 federal districts, there's one head court clerk at each district. That's 12 people who have hundreds of court clerks underneath them, but it takes her signature to access the Department of Fiscal Services website. Do we have one here in Salt Lake? Nope. But we have to go to that court? Like you're talking about going to the... Well, you do have a federal court here. We do. So, I guess my statement wasn't really true because the Ninth District has multiple federal courts. But I know Mary is ahead of the entire Ninth District. So we don't specifically go where Mary is. No, I, I bet you could go just to the federal court building here and talk to the head court clerk. But you're gonna have to open up a case that's 400 bucks, I think, is what they charge now to open a miscellaneous case. And then go home. Once you open it, and you got the CUSA number, because you want to have it open first, right? Then you have that number. 
Now you take that number home and you do your documents and you put that number on your documents and you go back and say convert this to a civil matter, a probate matter, a civil probate matter. Now she assigns a probate judge to it, right? And now you're just asking him with a motion to move the court for a decision on this probate, to settle the probate. You got get your account number. If, if you're older like me, on the back of my social security number has my banked and routing number, and then on my birth certificate, it has my CUSIP number. If you want to have more fun, go find a stockbroker, one of these, you know, Wells Fargo, uh, uh, that special bank that they have, what do they call that? The Wells Fargo Investment Services or something, where all the brokers are. Go make friends with one of those guys and say, here, here's my number off my birth certificate, here's my social security number, here's my driver's license, here's my military ID, here's my advanced degree in college number. Can you look up the main CUSIP number and match all these and show all the accounts on one spreadsheet? And then you have that, take that and attach it to your legal document, take it into... <laughs> Son-in-law, okay, see, there you go. Those guys can look it up, but th because they're a broker, yeah. they get to log into, it used to be I could, anybody could just log into Fidelity and do this, okay? But now they've kind of separated their website into broker-only information and general public information. So now it takes a broker to really look up the good stuff. Two sides of the coin right now. You got good and evil. You got Trump, you got the deep state. This includes the, the world, one world order, the UN, the United Nations, the Council on Foreign Relations, the IMF, the, I mean, I could go on and on and on, all right? So you got these people, and then you got we the people over here. We have been for a while, we're not now. Okay, and you, so you got this side and you got this side. So right now, President Trump and we the people are trying to get rid of the IRS. We're trying to get rid of the who? We're trying to get rid of the United Nations. We're trying to get rid of on and on and on and on and on, right? We're trying to stop all this. Most of these people are in business to traffic people and children. That's, that, do you understand that that's their whole MO and it has been forever since 1666? Huh? Probably even before that. Maybe even before that. But what I'm saying is, that's when they made it all legal, okay? To traffic. Everything is about trafficking. Everything is about trafficking you. And you, and you, and you, and you, and our kids. The problem is the kids, they exploit, right? So we're trying to get rid of all this and we're trying to bankrupt them. That's really the only way you can get rid of them. That's the easiest way and when Trump knows that. That's why he doesn't care if he sends three million to China or five million to Russia or he doesn't care. Let's spend all these Federal Reserve notes we can. And you know what the United Nations is saying right now? God, we're almost bankrupt. They're coming out and saying it. They're crying. All these governments. And if you look at Trump's first year in office, he met with over 30 prominent world leaders to help him with this plan. Do you know even Iran? He took the sword of Iran. Mm -hmm. Iran is under President Trump. It's control. Do you know the North Korea gave Trump control? Isn't that a new world order in itself? No. no, it's to dissolve the new world order. But the deep state's been in there running those guys. 
Yeah, deep state's been running all that. Communism's been running. I said this yesterday, what's happening in China right now breaks my heart. I have met so many good, sweet, honest, family, Chinese people in my life. They treat me like a king when I go over there, okay? And the Chinese Communist government is committing genocide upon the Chinese people right now through weather manipulation, food shortage. What's gonna happen when two billion people have no food? Well, just before they die, what's going to happen? Chaos. Absolute chaos. People get desperate, they turn into animals. Okay? And what did the government do? They've made it rain for how many days now? They're worried about that dam breaking. Some dams have already broke. They're worried about a very large dam breaking. In China, they built all the buildings with living space up here and commercial down here. So all their stores are down there. All their toilet paper, all their commodities, all their food. Where's the water level right now? These guys up here ain't got anything to eat right now. And this is happening all over China through weather manipulation. Lightning bolts so strong it splits buildings. See that building? Split it right in half. It went <laughs> collapsed into the water. Yeah, from one lightning bolt. How do you get a lightning bolt that strong to split a building in half? Weather patterns. Yeah. Manipulation of weather. So the Chinese government, there's about one million Chinese communists in government. They all drive black Audis, get paid real well, live up on the hill. Yeah, I don't think I'm wrong. They live up on the hill and there's two billion Chinese that are being genocided right now. As many as they can. Now there's a few that live up on the hill, all right? but they're not gonna have any food either. These guys have been storing their food. They got warehouses full of it. The military's full of it. They have all the military might and equipment. These guys work for a living. They farm, they push pigs around. I got spoiled with bacon when I was in China. <laughs> I'm telling you, they got a highway going this way over here and they got a highway going this way over here. And everything in between the highway has a creek right down through the middle of it. And they give anyone who wants it a section. You get 100 meters. And you come in, you put a little fence, and you grow garden. You grow fruit trees. You raise pigs. The guy that grows a garden in one section, he swaps with the pig farmer. In the next season, the pig farmer moves his fences Guy gardens over here where it's already tore up, rototilled and fertilized by the pigs. And then they get to eat the scraps left in the garden and rototill it up for the next time. And somebody goes out there every day with a stick about six, seven feet long. And they push the pigs around all the time. They just walk the pigs. The pigs are constantly moving and eating and moving, going down the creek, drinking. Leanest, best taste of meat you ever had. They're not all fat like ours. I can't even hardly go in a store anymore here and look at bacon packages. It's, all fat. it's like, I ain't eating that shit. I go to China, it's beautiful, thick, all meat. There's almost no fat on it. Flavor is awesome. They get a wide variety of diet over there. They're genociding the people in China because two million Chinese raised up and said, we want to be, join the sovereign government of Mongolia. We'd like to be sovereign, no longer communists. Over 20 countries have pulled out of the United Nations and, and, and declared their sovereignty. 20 countries. That doesn't bode well for the Bolivia, Bulgaria, Iceland. 
China wanted to, Mongolia did. Quite a few countries have declared their sovereignty. The United States would be nice if we did really soon, okay? We're supposed to already be, but there's not enough state nationals. Once you're a state national, you're a sovereign, okay? As, you're, as long as you're a U.S. citizen, you're a slave. You're not the king unless you've claimed your status. State Department just made an announcement a week or so ago that said they're getting more applications than they've ever seen for state nationals. Mike Pompeo said that. Now the coin, coin shortage is because President Trump took our coinage back. See, he says things like, I, Donald J. Trump, as President of the United States of America, do hereby take back the coinage of the United States. What did he just do when he said that? He did the same thing with our utility companies. He changed jurisdictions on them. He took it back on behalf of we the people. He told me June 22nd of 2019 that he's restored the republic and now it's up to me. He looked me right in the eye and said that. I want you to do it. My job's to train the trainers, by the way, not teach the students. Right. He's well, taking back the coinage from them. That's why we're having a coinage shortage. Wells Fargo is a Federal Reserve banking affiliate. Yeah. It can't get coins from the Federal Reserve. The only ones they're getting in is the ones we, the people, are walking in with and turning in. I recommend don't turn any in right now. Put them in a piggy bank. Save them for a little while. Okay? It's not that they're going to be worth any more. It's just that they're not going to be given to them. See, the trick is, what's it, what... The plan is, is we take, we take all these Federal Reserve notes out of our pockets and we take these things because these are just legal tender, they're not worth the paper they're written on. And what President Trump's trying to do is he's printing a whole bunch of United States notes that are backed by the gold and silver held by the Linden Havengard Trust. And he's back going to be, once we have enough of them printed, which has been a chore, should have been done a year ago, about a year behind schedule. But you take those things and you put them on all the armored car warehouses. And then the armored cars show up and they load the, federal, the US notes onto the car. They drive to the bank on a Friday and they put them in the vault and they take all these things and they take them out of the vault and they put them back in the armored car and they ship them to the Federal Reserve. And when load after load after load of these things show up at the Federal Reserve banks, President Trump will give them a call and say, use that to pay off our national debt and all of the mortgages and all the student loans, everything backed by the federal government, pay it all off. See, they, they, they insure all the mortgages, they insure all the student loans. And this is what people don't understand about your change. All of your notes are backed by the Federal Reserve, which is nothing. The change is backed by the Treasury. That's right. It's co our coinage. It's the United States of America. It's always going to be worth something. It's never going to lose its value. Change will never lose its value. Okay, history repeats itself, right? Okay, so you remember what, here, here's what happened. 1912, 1913, they created the Federal Reserve. They created the fiat currency. The Jekyll Island happened a few years before. Okay, they created these acts. Between 1905 and 1933, they created a whole bunch of acts of Congress that set up this whole money scheme and fraud scheme, period. That's when the majority of bad things happened. Now, actually, Lincoln started the prog problem and set up a few things, and on and on and on. There was some before 1905, but between 1905 1905, 1908 is when the church became a 501c3 and sold out the federal government as well, okay? Now, between 1908 and 1933, 
These are when the acts of Congress, you wanna learn a lot of history, just read all the acts, read the congressional records from all those years. And you'll see, if you can pick out the pieces of the puzzle in there, this system of fraud. This is how I've done it. This is how I'm able to stand in front of you and tell you all this stuff because I pull, I'm really good at puzzles. And I can see a piece from a mile away. And I grab this piece here. And I grab this piece over here. And I grab this piece here. And I put it all together because they burnt the box top. And that's the only way we can see the picture of the fraud, right? So they put in this Federal Reserve package. Then we had, they released a whole bunch of paper dollars into the public charitable trust between 1908 and 1922. And then we had the roaring 20s. And everybody was making more money than they had ever had. It stimulated the economy. People were singing and dancing and going to clubs and drinking whiskey and all this stuff, the roaring 20s. And they were spending money that they'd never had before. So they were going into debt, they were buying new homes, they were good. First mortgages were during that period of time. Before that, people paid cash for their house or they homesteaded. Now they're in the mortgage and they're going into debt and they're doing all this in the roaring 20s. And then what did the Federal Reserve do? They said, oh, now that we've done this, we can collapse it. And here comes the Great Depression and they collapsed the whole thing. And then they went back and bought all those houses for 50 cents on the dollar or 10 cents on a nickel on the dollar in a lot of cases. They bought up all these businesses. People jumped out of windows and committed suicide in New York and Chicago and any tall building they could jump out the window of because it destroyed their families. This was a planned event from 1908, okay? To release all this money, then to collapse it. Then what did they do? 1933, stepped in with the New Deal. They set up the Social Security program. They made all you citizens. They set up the SESTA QV Trust, and they did more than that. They confiscated all of my grandfather's gold. He was a geologist for the state of California, and they took over a million in gold from him at $20 an ounce. Do you know it's 2,000 plus an ounce right now? Do you know what would happen if I, he, he would have passed that down to me right now? What I'd be worth? They took over a million bucks from him. Okay. Yeah. I'd be a billionaire. One swoop. <laughs> yeah. So here's the issue. They did this, they manufactured this, they developed the plan. Okay, this is a poster that was drawn up by Mr. Aldrich and his buddy Crozier. They call it the octopus, it's the Aldrich plan. This was what they presented at the, on Jekyll Island, the meeting of the bankers that set up the whole Federal Reserve. Can you see that? Do you know it's spoken of in the Bible? The monster that rises up out of the sea and... Okay, this was the start of the downfall. Okay? I've seen that picture. All right. Evil rarely looks evil until it accomplishes its goal. It gains entrance by appearing attractive, desirable, and perfectly legitimate. It is a baited and camouflaged trap. That's a good quote. Edward Mandel House was a, uh, he, he, he was not a public servant. He never served one day in government. But he had the ear of several presidents, including being a chief private advisor to Woodrow Wilson, okay? <clears throat> Prior to 1912, Woodrow Wilson quoted, since I entered politics, I have chiefly had men's views confided to me privately. Some of the biggest men in the United States in the field of commerce and manufacturing are afraid of somebody. They are afraid of something. They know that there is a power somewhere so organized, so subtle, so watchful, so interlocked, so complete, so pervasive, 
that they had better not speak above their breath when they speak in condemnation of it or fear for their lives. They were talking about the Illuminati clear back then. Okay. Now, in 1921, in his final speech as president, he said, I am a most unhappy man. I have unwittingly ruined my country. A great industrial nation is now controlled by its system of credit. We are no longer a government by free opinion, no longer a government by conviction and the vote of the majority, but a government by the opinion and duress of a small group of dominant men. That was his final speech, a quote out of his final speech as president. Okay. Why did he quote that? Okay. In a meeting in the Oval Office with Woodrow Wilson and Edward Mandel House, Edward Mandel House said this. Now, Edward Mandel House was the one that gathered the bankers together on Jekyll Island. He was a Texas oil billionaire. Okay? And he had the ear of several presidents because of his wealth. And he said this. Very soon, every American will be required to register their biological property in a national system designed to keep track of the people and that will operate under the ancient system of pledging. I pledge allegiance to the flag, right? By such methodology, we can compel people to submit to our agenda, which will affect our security as a chargeback for our fiat paper currency. Every American will be forced to register or suffer being a unable to work and earn a living. They will be our chattel, and we will hold the security interest over them forever. By operation of the law merchant, under the scheme of secured transactions, Americans, by unknowingly or unwittingly delivering the bills of lading, the birth certificates, to us, will be rendered bankrupt and insolvent, forever to remain economic slaves through taxation, secured by their pledges, they will be stripped of their rights and given a commercial value designed to make us a profit and they will be none the wiser. For not one man in a million could ever figure our plans. If by accident one or two should figure it out, we have in our arsenal plausible deniability. After all, this is the only logical way to fund government by floating liens and debts to the registrants register your birth certificates, register your cars, register your kids, on and on, in the form of benefits and privileges. This will inevitably reap to us huge profits beyond our wildest expectations and leave every American a contributor to this fraud, which we will call social insurance. It became the Social Security Act. Without realizing it, every American will insure us for any loss we may incur and in this manner, every American will unknowingly be our servant, however begrudgingly. The people will become helpless and without any hope for their redemption, and we will employ the high office of the president of our dummy corporation to foment this plot against America. Who wrote this again? This was a speech, the talk of Edward Mantle House to President Wilson, Woodrow Wilson. It kind of lays it out right there, right? The whole system of the fraud. Did that qualify as Sure as hell should be. If sedition, if nothing else. They do it under the 1917 War Powers Act, the, the Trading with the Enemy Act, the, the crash of 1929, the security of our gold. Here's our, the three flags we have. The flag of peace, the flag of war, and the captured flag. Show me the captured flag. Captured flag has gold fringe around it. I thought that was admiralty flag, is what I read. Maritime flag, lost at sea. Admiralty flag is a captured flag. When the pirates would capture a, another ship, they would pull their flag down, sew a fringe around it, hang it up underneath their flag on their ship, saying that they captured this ship. And they just hoped to fill up their flagpole with captured flags. 
And that's exactly what the Bar Association did to us. Yes. They displayed it in every courtroom as a captured war flag. That's why it's in the courtrooms? Yes. So this, it's that's called Inland Piracy. piracy. Okay. The Shepherd Towner Maternity Act created the birth registration, known as the birth certificate. Okay. Well, yeah, Shepherd Towner Maternity Act. I mean, I can go back to all the acts of Congress that set up this whole system of fraud. It was done precept upon precept, and it set it all up. Between 1900 and 1904, there's a set of cases called the Insular Tariff Cases. Those cases were a series of Supreme Court cases that gave Congress permission to create a separate nation using the federal territories and possessions as states like Guam, Puerto Rico, American Samoa, and others, became a union of states known as the United States of America Minor. From then on, Congress re began referring to this entity as if it was referring to the continental United States. Ah, so they used the Supreme Court to set up all of our U.S. territories as the United States of America Minor and then they started referring it, and this is how they took away our de jure government of the United States of America and made it de facto. And they just used it a little at a time. So who ran the Supreme Court? Bar Association. They've stole this country. We the people are at war with the bar. I keep saying that over and over and over again. They control everything. Any one thing I want you to study besides the United States Code is I want you to study a case called Hale versus Hankel. You should have heard it. It's been upheld more than 1,600 times. But there's no other case in history that explains our status as well as that. An individual st state citizen, which is a state national who's in office, right? has unalienable constitutional rights, while a U.S. citizen, a creature of the state, has privileges and civil rights, and is held subject to all policies, rules, codes, and statutes, the same as any other public servant, upheld over 1,600 times by both the district and the Supreme Courts. That one paragraph out of that case pretty much explains <laughs> what you need to know. Why is anybody claiming to be a United States citizen? I don't know. I can't figure it out. That's self-induced slavery, just by making that claim. A legal person equals a legal fiction, which equals a US citizen, okay? One of the terms used predominantly by the present civil governments and courts in America is legal person. Just what is a legal person? Here are its definitions. A, a legal person is a body of persons or an entity considered as a corporation as having many of the rights and responsibilities of a natural person and especially the capacity to sue and be sued. See, they can't really sue a state national. <laughs> but a U.S. citizen, they can sue them. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. I could read that whole page, but you get past that, there's no sense. So it's a state national, you don't sue, you claim. You claim. If I go out here in the car and I go to a stop sign and I get hit by a driver while I'm stopped, it's his fault, obviously. I get his name, his address, and his insurance company and his policy number. I contact my insurance company and I say, hey, this guy's at fault. I'm putting in a claim, here's his policy number, go sue his insurance company. I don't sue the driver. I make a claim and I sue his insurance company. So when we make a claim, all these city agencies and what have you, these corporations are all bonded and insured. We just sued the state of Montana, we sued MAKO, we sued their insurance company. If they're bonded for five million, I'm going to sue them for four million nine hundred ninety-five thousand nine hundred ninety-five bucks. Right. Because then they'll settle with me. 
If I decide to sue them for $10 million and they got a $5 million bond, they're gonna find some way to make it so I lose. They will. Yes. But if they're covered, we can go right up to the maximum amount of their policy. See? So th then the insurance company does exactly what they did in Montana. They went to the sheriff who was beating people up and violating their constitutional rights. We sued the insurance company for five million bucks, which was the sheriff's in limit on his insurance. And then the insurance company goes over to the sheriff and says, hey, you knock that shit off. You keep violating their constitutional rights, we're gonna drop our policy. You're gonna be liable on your own. And the sheriff's going, well, I ain't losing my house. Okay, I'll knock it off. Yeah, you see? Let the insurance company put them in the line. It's a great way to do it. Dun and Bradstreet numbers. I, as I'm scanning through this old presentation that I probably haven't looked at in a year, I wrote it like 10 years ago, is all the Dun & Bradstreet numbers. The United States government's is 0527141196. Okay, the U.S. Department of Justice is 0116696764. Department of Treasury is 02666. Oh, that's interesting. 02666-1067. Yeah. Anyway, I got page after page of them here. You want to know states? I got, I even have the National Aeronautics and Space Administration's, NASA's, and U.S. Food and Drug Administration is 13818-2175, and we're suing them right now. She's been acting as one of my paralegals and doing things for me over the last year. And I have a few of those around the country. One of them's a judge. She acts as paralegal sometimes. And so we can handle some of this stuff. But uh, here, uh, let me go to the state of Utah. State of Utah, 00909434301. The city of Salt Lake City is 01709-6780. Which one? <laughs> State of Utah, 009 4301. City of Salt Lake City, 01709 So after lunch, we're going to talk about know thy enemy. <laughs> 